order. Uh, if you're a member of the of the gallery, if you would kindly sign in in the in the back corner of the room to let folks know who you are, where you are, and what you're here for, uh, that'd be great. Uh, most, if not all, of you are here for the uh, Eaton Lakeview 40B. That'll be second on the agenda. We have a quick preliminary matter to take care of before we get to that, and I can uh, assure you that that will be quick. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, we're going to call the continuation of Case 1802 to order. Uh, Zoning Board of Appeals hold a continuance of a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room uh, tonight, Wednesday, March 7th at 7 p.m. on the application by Attorney Latham on behalf of Vincent and Kimberly Shanley pursuant to MGL Chapter 48, Section 9 for a special permit under Reading Zoning Bylaws Section 532 and 547 to construct an addition to the existing single-family dwelling and to create an attached accessory apartment on the property located at 32 Whitehall Lane in Reading, Massachusetts. Brad? If I may. <coughs> Members of the board, uh, we're going to request a further continuance to try and reconcile the plans between the architect and the land surveyor. Uh, the next available date is April 4th. That, that work? Fine. Okay, we'll take a motion for uh, continuance April 4th. So moved. John, second. Robert, any discussion? All those in favor? I uh, zero zero. You continue to April 4th. Thank, Thank you, you, Brad. Appreciate it. <laughs> maybe you want to, I don't know, maybe Chris, you want to say to Chris? Yeah, yeah, we do. We're going to work that out once you guys. Julie, okay. right. should coordinate with seating to see. Oh. Okay. I'd like to think I do more than that. Uh, All well, right. Like, no, of course you are. Thank you, sir. Good to see that. I will now turn the proceedings over to Acting Chairman, Vice Chair John Jarima for the opening of the next public hearing. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Julie, we want to uh, go to Chris. Want to shuffle? Yeah. Where are we shuffling to? To move in the middle. Just move off. Yes, everyone moves down one, then we can have the council up to you. We can do that. All right. <laughs> Opening of the second area of the evening, uh, which is like you in Eaton Street, 40B. Um, we have a process that we follow, and it's the same whether it's a 40B, a 40A, uh, whatever it might be before the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, first on the agenda is always reading of the a public notice, a public hearing, which I will read briefly, and then we will move on. So. Um, the Zoning Board of Appeals will hold a public hearing in the Selectman's Meeting Room at Town Hall, 16 Rule Street, Reading, Mass. on Wednesday, March the 7th, 2018 at 7 p.m. On a petition of the Eaton Lake View Development LLC, who seeks a comprehensive permit to develop 120 units of rental housing on 4.33 acres of land that is partially in a residential zone and partially in an industrial zone under Mass General Laws Chapter 40B, Section 20-23 with waivers from zoning requirements on the property comprising six tax parcels <coughs> known as zero lakeview avenue map 17 lot 131 zero lakeview avenue map 18 lot 2 23 through 25 lakeview ave map 18 lot 1 zero e eaton street map 17 lot 274 Zero Eaton Street, Map 17, Lot 275, and 128 Eaton Street, Map 17, Lot 276 in Reading, Massachusetts. The application and associate plans are available to the public in the Public Service Office in the Town Hall, Monday through Thursday, 
7.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. and Tuesday from 7.30 to 7 p.m. and the Zoning Board of Appeals website and the long one so I'm not going to read it. Uh, and what I didn't bring is the, the rest of the... <laughs> Mr. Chairman, point of order. We've got another 20 people out in the hall who'd like to attend the meeting. Um, I, I, we aren't set up for the next room for a TV or anything, so I'm, I don't know what to do. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, can we move there? this way? If you yeah. can, if you yeah. can come in and sit there. and you want to sit down. Why don't we move this way, I'm, folks, and along the sides and yeah. try to bring people yeah. in the hall? Yeah. I know we might be behind someone, but it's better than nothing. to move some chairs in there are some people who are elderly who probably will need to sit do you want me to just move chairs along the side yeah i'm happy to do it and, and i'm sure there's people who can help um, yeah. there's chairs in the other room correct yeah. so we'll just move them we'll, we'll move them right. <laughs> As was, as was just brought up, uh, we have a fire code here in the town, and the fire code uh, only allows for a certain number of chairs within the room of a meeting hall. So we are at the limit right now. Uh, if you want, what you might, might want to do is to open that second doorway and put the chairs on the outside of the room so that you can hear what's going on. So I have a suggestion. If we move to the other room, many of us have cell phones. We can record it if you want. I mean, that's fine, too, if that's okay with people who are presenting. Are you okay with that? Uh, I, we are being recorded. I mean, if you can pick that up next door, that, that's fine. Oriana, what do you think? I mean, there's a lot of people out there. <laughs> You know what? I'm going to say if you want if you want to go into the next room and use your cell phones to pick this up, that's fine. Well, but I want her to be able to do a presentation. You have a, you know what? We'll for anybody who can give up their seat for people who are older. Can't bring anyone There's chairs available for Okay, we'll go on with the meeting then and we'll do it the best we can <coughs> with what we have to work with. This notice was published and sent to the planning boards of neighboring towns of North Reading, Linfield. Um, I'm trying to remember this. Woburn, uh, Stoneham, Stoneham, Woburn, Woburn uh, Wakefield, Wakefield. <laughs> um, and all of as this goes out, all the neighboring communities are aware of each and every hearing that the zoning reading, the reading zoning board of appeals does here. Um, this is a 40B. Um, and part of the process is that uh, we normally turn it over to the applicant at this particular point, but we have a little bit of house uh, rules and regulations to go through too for this particular meeting. So um, what we expect during the regular hearings, um, the process is that when we do when we do 
allow the applicant to make his presentation. Uh, the board uh, gets the opportunity to question, ask questions for clarification purposes or whatever uh, first before we do anything else. Uh, and since there is a large uh, public involvement on this particular 40B, um, as there usually is, uh, I'm just going to say that I'm going to give you a couple of rules that we need to abide by. One is that this is uh, an orderly uh, meeting. We all will get to speak. Um, please wait on, when you raise your hand, please wait until you're recognized by the chair. When you stand up, please give your name and your address. Uh, the questions, uh, if it's going to a specific person or a team member, please go to the chair for that. And the last is to keep your comments relevant, minimize the redundancy, and please be clear and succinct. I know there's a lot of people who want to give input. This meeting is not going to be a one-on-one, one one, uh, a onesie. Um, it's not going to be done in two meetings. It's not going to be done in three or four meetings. So everybody's going to get their opportunity. And the intention is on all 40 Bs is to provide the best possible project for the town of Reading because we all live here. So the first thing I'm going to do is introduce members of the board and the people sitting at the table. Um, I'll start over here. Julie um, Mercier, Community you, Development Director. Uh, Chris, Chris Heap, Town Council. Town Council, specializing in 40 Bs. <laughs> Robert Rayburn, member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Nick Pernice, also a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh -huh. Sai Coet, member of the Zoning Board. Andrew McNichol, Planning Assistant. Jean Delios, Assistant Town Manager. Kristen Grover, Assistant um, Administrative Specialist. And before, before I start anything, I'm going to ask each of the board members, um, have we all had the opportunity to look at the site, compare the site relative to the package that we have? Are we, are we ready to move on that? The answer is yes. 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 Okay. yes. Uh, I'm going to turn the presentation right now over to Chris, uh, who's going to give us an overview of, of uh, 40B. Uh, this is not... How many 40 Bs have we done with you now, Chris? Uh, this is number three. <laughs> number three. So we go through this process all the time because not all, all people are understanding of what a 40 B is. So, Chris, go ahead. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Chris Heap from Town Council's office. Just wanted to spend probably about 10, 15 minutes uh, just doing a very quick overview of um, 40 B, what it is, um, and what the public hearing typically looks like and the timetable for uh, working through it. Um, what is Chapter 40B? Uh, Chapter 40B at its most general uh, is a uh, state law that um, governs uh, certain types of development, specifically if an applicant sets aside uh, usually 25 percent of the number of dwelling units in a housing project as uh, deed restricted uh, to be affordable in perpetuity then they get to apply for a comprehensive permit. Um, a comprehensive permit is one, uh, is a kind of application in which the Zoning Board of Appeals, this board up here, uh, stands in the shoes of every other local board uh, and land use official in town uh, and gets to issue a one permit that covers all of the uh, local rules, regulations, and bylaws that are typically applied by everyone else in town. Um, the term of art uh, that is applied to the ZBA here is that the ZBA gets to stand in the shoes of all local boards. That term is defined as any local board or official, <coughs> including but not limited to any board of survey, board of health, planning board, conservation commission, historical commission, water, sewer, or other commission, fire, police, traffic, or other department, building inspector, or similar official. Um, and then it goes on to say that any other board, regardless of geographical jurisdiction or the source of their authority, uh, shall be deemed local boards if they perform functions usually performed by locally created boards. Um, so that is an incredibly broad uh, term uh, defining what it is that the ZBA gets to do uh, with respect to this application. There are only a few exceptions to that general rule that I just cited. 
Um, there are, uh, if a local official is applying a state program, not a local program, then the board does not uh, step in to do that. The classic examples of what the ZBA doesn't do is uh, stand in the shoes of a local board of health applying Title V, which is not, gonna, I don't think, going to be relevant here, uh, and the building commissioner applying the state building code. Uh, those uh, remain effective, and those get applied by um, the other boards. Other example, Conservation Commission applying the State Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, the Conservation Commission gets to do, um, continue to apply the state, state act. Um, so that's the first major component of 40B, is what the ZBA gets to, um, gets to assume the authority of everyone else in town. The second major aspect is that the ZBA uh, is empowered to, uh, and sometimes required to, grant waivers from local rules and regulations uh, that would normally apply to a project. So regulations pertaining to uh, densi normal density, height, setback, um, all of those kinds of things can be waived by the Zoning Board of Appeals on the request of the applicant. Um, it does not always need to grant all waivers that have been requested, but that is uh, just one of the main things that it will do uh, typically in a 40B hearing. Um, so that's the general overview. In terms of process, how uh, this, this um, process normally works. The ZBA is just beginning its part of this process tonight, but it's actually not the first step for the applicant. Um, in order to apply to the Zoning Board of Appeals, the applicant must first uh, get what is called a project eligibility letter from a state subsidizing agency. Um, in this case, the applicant has already uh, done that part of it. Um, this applicant obtained a project eligibility letter for mass housing dated October 24, 2017. So with that letter issued from mass housing, uh, that letter is what clears the way for the applicant to file this application that's now in front of uh, this board. Once uh, the comprehensive permit application is filed with the Zoning Board of Appeals, a couple of very important timelines immediately get triggered. Uh, once the application is filed, the ZBA normally has 30 days to open its public hearing. Uh, once the ZBA opens the hearing, which is tonight, it would then typically have 180 days to close the pub to conduct and then close the public hearing. Um, that 180 days can be extended by agreement between the board and the applicant. Uh, once the hearing is public hearing is closed, the ZBA then typically has another 40 days to vote a decision. And once the ZBA votes a decision, it then typically has 14 days to file uh, a written decision with the town clerk. Now, all of those normal, normally applicable um, deadlines that I just mentioned have actually been adjusted for purposes of this hearing uh, on this application. Uh, the applicant has uh, agreed in writing uh, with the ZBA to extend the time for the ZBA to conduct the public hearing, vote and render a decision, and file that decision with the town clerk until February 22nd of 2019. Um, so that, uh, that agreement has already been uh, uh, presented by the applicant. Um, and so I think the important point there is we're, as, we're, uh, as we sit here tonight, the ZBA is at the very beginning of a very long um, hearing process. And as we sit here tonight, the ZBA is beginning this process with more time um, than a zoning board of appeals typically starts the process with. Um, normally, you start with 180 days as the deadline in mind. Uh, here we have more than that uh, already effectively in place. Um, in addition to those timelines that I just mentioned, there are a couple additional uh, deadlines that um, uh, bear mention. And that is that there are certain safe harbors uh, that uh, can exist in towns um, that can serve to uh, uh, either permanently or temporarily insulate the town from comprehensive permit applications. Those are, uh, the, if the town reaches its 10% of affordable housing, of it, if the town hits 10% of its housing stock as affordable, um, it uh, is then capable of denying comprehensive permit applications as long as that remains true. Um, and there are a couple other that provide um, temporary insulation from, from comprehensive permit applications. If the board, the Zoning Board of Appeals, when an application is filed, believes that um, it has the right to invoke one of those uh, safe harbor provi provisions, then it needs to notify the applicant that it's doing that within the first 50, within 15 days after opening its public hearing. Um, so that, it's, it's sort of somewhat unusual for a ZBA to be able to invoke that right. 
Um, but uh, the town, that, that, that is the position that the board finds itself in tonight. Uh, the town is currently benefited by a safe harbor uh, on the basis that it has been certified to be in compliance with the housing production plan. Um, and so if the board wants to uh, flag that as, a, uh, as something that it can invoke with respect to this application, it needs to uh, do that within 15 days from right now. Uh, and I would add that the board does not need to actually deny the application, but it needs to instead just notify the applicant that it has, it believes it has the right to apply the safe harbor um, and notify the applicant and DHCD in writing of that within the next 15 days. So that's, I uh, just want to flag that in this sort of overview, but that is something uh, that the board uh, should consider uh, and talk about further uh, later, perhaps later on in the evening. Um, Okay, uh, that's the sort of hearing timelines. Um, what is it that the board is doing in a hearing and how does 40B uh, govern your review of these kinds of applications? Um, the main uh, legal question that, that will come into play with, with most of what the board does on this and other 40B applications is uh, uh, under the regulations, the legal standard is whether you, what your act, whether your actions are consistent with local needs. Uh, that's a term of art in DHCD's regulations. Um, and the board can, applying that legal standard, can ordinarily only deny a comprehensive permit application if the denial would be consistent with local needs. What that means under the regulations is um, that your decision is reasonable in light of, on the one hand, the regional need for lower moderate income housing in town, and two, local concerns. Um, local concerns are defined as the need to protect the health and safety of the occupants of the proposed project or of the residents of the municipality, to protect the natural environment, to promote better site and building design in relation to the surroundings and municipal and regional planning, or to preserve open spaces. So that's local concern is defined broadly uh, as all of those things I just mentioned there. Um, the, the, so, and what I just described in terms of whether something is consistent with local needs um, is a balancing test between the need for affordable housing and local concerns on the other. So you're always balancing the need for affordable housing with the local concerns. The caveat to that is that when you're applying that balancing test, uh, the board typically has to keep in mind that in the event of a denial or a conditional approval, the applicant always has the right to appeal the board's decision to the Housing Appeals Committee. Uh, and if any decision on a comprehensive permit goes to the Housing Appeals Committee, the standard of review applied there is weighted very heavily in favor of the need for local uh, affordable housing in town. Uh, as long as the town is under the 10% or is not benefited by one of the safe harbors, uh, there is a absolute presumption that the need for affordable housing outweighs the local concern that you're citing. So uh, it, that's not impossible to overcome, but it, just in terms of the general framework of 40B, the balancing test versus of affordable housing versus local concerns is tilted in favor of the need for affordable housing. Um, so that's uh, one thing there. The next question, um, much of what the board is going to be asked to do in this hearing uh, and when it renders the decision is to rule on all of the waivers that the applicant needs from local rules and regulations. Maximum building, maximum number of units per lot, all of those kinds of things are waivers that the board is going to have to, to, to rule on one by one. Um, the standard of, uh, st and so the standard of review when the board is considering whether to grant a waiver or not is uh, at, in the first instance whether denying the waiver is going to render the project uneconomic for the <coughs> to pursue, um, and if the answer to that question is yes, then you fall back to the the legal standard I just mentioned, which is balancing the need for affordable housing versus um, uh, the local concern that the board is, is worried about. Um, so when granting a waiver, again, the standard is first whether it would render the project uneconomic to uh, the balancing of the need for affordable housing and uh, the local concern. Um, so that's uh, granting of the waivers. A couple other, uh, following back to the question of how the hearing is going to normally work on a comprehensive <coughs> permit application, um, in terms of the conduct of the hearing, once the hearing opens, uh, given the the hundred, 
the 180 day timeline, which is the normal one that we have uh, extended already here, is can, can be quite tight. Here we have the luxury of some additional measure of time. But in any 40B hearing, in the early stages, the board is going to want to think about hiring uh, expert peer reviewers, uh, which it can do at the applicant's expense, um, and get those peer reviewers up and running to review what the applicant is presenting to you and offer comment. Um, those peer reviewers will typically include civil engineer, um, transportation engineer, and uh, I believe the last couple we did here also included an architectural peer reviewer, which I think uh, was, was quite useful. Um, so just in terms of the items to, to think about uh, over the next um, early stage of the hearing, um, one, that's get peer reviewers lined up and ready to go. Uh, two, another important part that the board uh, should include, should build into the early, early part of the hearing, is to solicit comments from all of the other boards, commissions, and land use officials in town, public safety officials in town, <coughs> who might ordinarily have been issuing these kinds of permits uh, but aren't going to do that because it's all up to you here. Um, I'm thinking of the CPDC, uh, you know, building commissioner, fire department, police department. Uh, the board wants to reach out and solicit comments um, and from all of those and get those into the record <coughs> so that the board can apply uh, the, you know, comments and concerns of all of those other land use uh, people in town. Um, and the third point about the conduct of the hearing is that we have approximately a year before the board's going to need to file a decision with the town clerk but the board always needs to build in enough time toward the end of its public hearing so that it can produce a reasonably complete decision written decision and circulate it to the public and to the applicant with a, a good measure of time left in the hearing window um, I would say you know 30 days to 45 days at least um, to produce a written decision, including the conditions that the board intends to impose on the project so that it can share it with the applicant. The reason for that is that um, if the board, if the, that sharing the decision, including all of the conditions that the board wants to impose, gives the applicant an opportunity to object to some of those conditions on the grounds that they will render the project uneconomic, either one condition by itself or all of the conditions in total. If the applicant objects to some of the conditions as rendering the project uneconomic, then the board can demand to see from the applicant a pro forma outlining all of the finances of the, of the, of the project. So the applicant is essentially put to the task of proving that what you want to do will render the project uneconomic. The board doesn't get to demand that pro forma from the applicant until it has produced the decision first and the applicant has objected to the conditions that you want to impose. So if we, you know, get to, if it gets down to the wire and there's a week left and we have to close the hearing, you know, there's, there's no opportunity to sort of uh, have that back and forth with the applicant. So um, I think we've, the board's always been good about doing that, but I just want to have that uh, fresh in everybody's mind that, that you know, the, the, you need to leave enough time at the end to engage in that exercise there. Um, so that's the public hearing and uh, all of my comments on the board's decision. Um, only other things I'd note are that um, once the board files a you know, files its decision with the town clerk, um, the applicant has the opportunity to appeal the um, board's decision to the Housing Appeals Committee, which is unusual and only applies to this kind of decision. Uh, that's beneficial for the applicant because, as I mentioned earlier, um, conditions and um, when, one, when an applicant appeals to the Housing Appeals Committee, the standard of review is weighed heavily in favor of uh, the need to provide more affordable housing in town and weighed uh, not in favor of the local concerns that the board um, <laughs> is applying. That's not to say that, you know, the town or the ZBA never wins at the hack, but just, you know, you can't talk about 40B without noting that um, the appeal to the Housing Appeals Committee exists, uh, and that can often be weighted in favor of the applicant. Um, abutters, other parties agreed by a board decision, always have the appeal, the right to appeal the decision to. Abutters and other parties who are aggrieved appeal to land court or superior court. They don't get the same right to go to the Housing Appeals Committee. Um, so that's that's the, in a nutshell, that's the that's the hearing process. Um, happy to answer your <coughs> questions. But that's that's all I've got for now. Um, any questions from the board? 
from Chris's presentation. Um, I'm just going to ask, um, was there anybody in the, room, in the room who may not have understood everything that Chris said? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody understood. Good. We can move right on then. I'm going to, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to ask uh, just a couple of questions and I'm going to ask the board if they have any questions also. Uh, and then we're going to move right into the uh, presentation by the applicants. I don't know what the weather is forecasting outside, but we want to make sure we get everybody here home safely too. So first question I have is either for Julie or for Jean. Um, where do we stand right now in terms of um, affordable units in the town and the percentage you keep in recall? We're at 9.35 percent. And that's with uh, the safe harbor? Yes. Okay. Um, and as I, as I looked at the thing from uh, Mass Housing, it looks like we're 117 units short of the 10 percent, but that's not going to be effective until February of um, 2019. So by getting out in front of this now, we have time to project that forward. Um, and if the board comes up with a uh, with an acceptance that's modified, if it's going to be modified from the applicant, that still gives us time uh, to do something about this. So we're, we're we're trying to be proactive and ahead of the game. Is that is that correct? Okay. I'm trying not to go into this because I... Okay. So the first thing that I would like to do at the present time is um, as we go through this, and I'm going to ask Chris to come back because we have another uh, piece of uh, information to read into the public hearing which I'm going to hold on to until we have the presentation from the applicant which I'm trying to limit to somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. I'm going to try to do the same thing with uh, the uh, abutters who have a presentation this evening, and then we'll see where we are in time. But uh, remember that after, after the presentation is made, the first people who have access to the presentation is the board members. They have to get it clear in their mind. They can either ask a series of questions or they can pass and hold their comments until later. But that's what we'll do. So I'm just going to, at this point, turn it over to the, uh, turn it over to uh, Theodore uh, Rodante. Rodante, um, correct. Um, to make the presentation for us. So that, uh, so, why? Well, do we need that space over there? Uh, we'd like to put some things up on the board, if, uh, with the board's permission. Make it. Uh, I believe easier. Go ahead. Uh, there are some chairs in here. If some of the people on the outside want to come in. Just tell me which ones to open. Sorry. Someone stay here. There's a school out there too. You will need to tell me which ones want me to open. Can I, can I use two, can I do the clicker yeah. from over there? Okay. Yeah, that'll work. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, members of the board, town council, staff. Uh, my name is Ted Regnante. Uh, I'm an attorney with offices in Wakefield, uh, and I concentrate my practice in Chapter 40B. I've done 40Bs throughout the state. Uh, and have been very active with DHCD uh, in the regulatory process. What I'd like to do first of all is introduce the development team to you. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, entity that is the applicant and the developer, which is a limited dividend organization, which means that it's agreed to limit its profits uh, in accordance with the requirements and the guidelines uh, of the subsidizing agency. Uh, that LLC, uh, the members are Joe Federa, Joe Guy Federa, and Guy Federa. 
uh, and they are local developers uh, uh, in, in the town, have done other projects in the town. Uh, my associate is Jesse Schomer, who's going to put some things up on the board as well as uh, the names of the uh, members of the team. As you can see, uh, the next one down is Chris Sparagis, who is here. He is our engineer from uh, Williams and Sparagis. Uh, Frank Curtis and David D. Benedetto, uh, who are responsible for the architectural and the design. And Kim Har uh, Ar uh, Hazavashian, who is our traffic uh, uh, engineer. And Ed Mushant, uh is a uh, 40B consultant who's worked throughout the state, uh, very familiar with all of the regulations. So we think we have assembled a very good team uh, this evening. What I'd like to do is, first of all, uh, I agree with everything that town council said in, in his analysis of Chapter 40B, very thorough and very accurate. The one thing that I wanted to stress that he stated but I wanted to make sure that the board understands this and the members of the public understand it. We acknowledge that you have reached safe harbor so that you could, if you wanted to, within 15 days of the opening of the hearing, invoke your rights under safe harbor, which would prevent us from, go from going forward with this application. What we have agreed to do in writing and we've given a letter uh, to the board, is to uh, extend the time to utilize and invoke uh, Safe Harbor until February 22nd, 2019. So we've agreed to extend that 15 days. So you have the opportunity and the right up until February 22nd, 2019 to deny this on the basis that you've reached Safe Harbor. So, in a sense, we have given you more rights than, than uh, what's provided for under the law. And the reason we want to do that is because we want to work with you and we want to work with the folks here in the audience to come up with a 40B that makes sense for the town, makes sense for us, and makes sense for the folks in the audience. Um, we've agreed to extend the time for review by the ZPA and action until February 23rd, 2019. So as Chris indicated, you'll have much more than 180 days. And we think that process uh, will, will help and, and help us to address and work with the board and with the neighbors to come up with a project that hopefully makes sense for everybody. So all of the town's rights to invoke safe harbor and deny the application have been retained by the town. So you're giving nothing up, you're having more rights than you would have under the regulations. So we want to start this hearing process by showing that we're cooperative, that we want to work with you. That's the reputation that I have and the members of my team uh, to, to not make this an adversary uh, proceeding, but to make it a cooperative uh, proceeding. With that having been said, let me go through a few things uh, on the application, and then I'm going to turn it over to the engineer who will go into detail. So these are up on the board, and, and people can see them, but let me kind of uh, give an overview. So as the chairman indicated, the site is a total of 4.33 acres located on two adjust adjacent sites, one on Eaton, Lot A, and one on Lakeview, Lot B, each of which includes three lots. The property is at the intersection of Eaton and Lakeview. The Eaton-Lakeview site uh, is located at the boundary between a residential neighborhood and a commercial district. It's directly behind the crossing at Walker's Brook Shopping Center, separated from that development by Walker's Brook, a man-made canal. The site location is accessible to nearby shopping centers, the Reading Town Center, Route 128, of the rail station, and a bus stop. The uh, 
Lot A contains two empty lots and one lot improved with a two-family rental property. Lot B contains a single-family rental property, a two-family rental property, and a commercial garage. <coughs> it was historically used as a contractor's yard. We are proposing to raise all of the existing buildings on both lots and redevelop the lot with a 120-unit multi-family residential development. There will be three residential buildings, one located on Lot A and two located on Lot B. The, uh, the, the structures will have four stories on the street side and five in the rear, and you'll hear later on that's one of, that is one of the concerns uh, that the neighbors have is, is the number of stories and the height of the building. The 120 units are split into three buildings, 40 in each building. There are 54 one-bedroom units, 54 two-bedroom, and 12 three-bedroom. The parking spaces, there are 181 parking spaces, which is one and a half per unit, which frankly is the state standard for parking in multifamily buildings. There are 94 garage spaces, 87 above ground, and 90 handicapped. There's two-way circular access driveways for both lots, uh, and we've met with the fire department because that was one of their concerns. The unimproved section of Lakeview Avenue will be improved to allow vehicle and emergency access between the two lots. The developer also proposes at the developer's expense to bring Lakeview Avenue up to town standards as a public way to enable it to be adopted as a public way, including one sidewalk. I'm sure you've all been down the street. The, the street is in horrible condition, and it's calling for correction. And that's one thing the, the developer has agreed to do to bring that uh, street up to uh, local standards so it can be accepted as a, as a public way. There will be a community hall of approximately 2,000 space, be a playground on lot B, sidewalks throughout the site for pedestrian access, bike racks in each parking garage, and we intend to work with the CONCOM uh, to uh, create a park in the proposed flood compensation area behind the building on lot, on lot A, and that's something we'll be doing during the process. And we also will be simultaneously with, with the uh, ZBA going through the process with the uh, Conservation Commission, uh, which, of course, as Chris indicated, has jurisdiction uh, under the State Wetlands Act, separate and distinct from your jurisdiction. And, of course, they will be looking for your recommendations on waivers because we have asked for waivers from the local bylaw, which comes under your jurisdiction and not their jurisdiction. Um, due to the presence of Walker's Brook and adjacent marsh marshes, a portion of the rear of both lots contained these protected wetland areas. <coughs> Existing utility services appear to be adequate for water, sewer, natural gas, electric and cable and internet. And these services will be upgraded, repaired, or replaced if necessary. Uh, I'm going to let uh, our traffic engineer talk about traffic, but in his opinion, the project will have negligible, negligible effect on area traffic and safety. I'm sure you'll hear otherwise from, from the audience. Twenty-five percent of the units in the development, that is 30 total units, 14 one-bedroom, 13 two-bedroom, and three three-bedroom will be affordable to households at 80% of median family income. There will be a local preference plan uh, as approved by DHCD so that up to 70% of the affordables uh, will be uh, subject to a preference, a local preference. The rents in this project for market rate rents will be approximately 2000 for one bedroom, 2500 for two bedroom, 
and 20, 2800 for three bedroom. The affordables, in accordance with that, with the formula that I just stated, uh, the one bedrooms will be 1358 with a utility allowance of $108. The two bedrooms, $1,612 with a utility allowance of $146. And the three bedrooms, $1,850 with a utility allowance of $182. So you can see that uh, the prices for these affordable units are, are going to make it very attractive for, uh, uh, for people who can qualify. Uh, I think I mentioned about uh, wetlands. We did a, a wetland resource delineation as to where the line is. Uh, on, that was done on September 29, 2016. That's good for a three-year period under the state law. So we'll be working uh, with that as we go through the process with you folks and with the uh, Conservation uh, Commission as well. Um, I have seen the summary of comments and, obje and objections by the neighbors, uh, led by Michael Flynn and Boriana Nova. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yes. Good. Uh, and, I'm, and you're going to hear from them in a, in a few minutes. The issues that they have raised are density of the project. They feel the project is too large. The massing of buildings, the design, <coughs> traffic, and environmental, all, all concerns that uh, are legitimate concerns that need to be addressed. I want to make this commitment to the board and to you folks. We want to work with the board through this process to go through these issues and what are the other issues are presented. And we want to work and get comments and uh, if we need to make adjustments, we're willing to do that as long as it keeps the project economic, which is of course the state standards. So, I want to make that commitment. One of the things that I have done in the many uh, 40Bs that I've handled is during the process we like to encourage workshops. So a workshop would consist of members of staff, uh, different people in the town departments, uh, usually one member of, of the Zoning Board of Appeals, town council, and we would invite a representative or representatives of the neighbors to try to sit down across a table and, and, and work through some of these issues. So we, we want to make that commitment to do that uh, during the process. We recognize that the town is, uh, I believe, 117 units short of the 10% goal. At least that's what I saw in, from DHCD. Um, and we recognize that uh, after February of 2019, it's possible to get another year or another two years reprieve on 40B by invoking a new safe harbor. That is, you've got the one through February of 2019. But by working with this project and coming up with a good project, depending upon the number of units, the town could get another reprieve for either one or two years. And uh, let me say, we have been working with staff. We've had, I believe, two meetings with staff to go through the technical issues. We'll continue to, to, uh, to do that. So with that having been said, let me turn it over to Chris, who can go into some more detail. I've probably gone over my, my time and eaten up some of your time. That's OK. <laughs> Uh, thank you, members of the board. Uh, for the record, my name is Chris Spiragis. I'm a registered professional engineer uh, here in Massachusetts uh, with offices in Middleton, Massachusetts. We're a firm of about 20 uh, professionals, professional land surveyors, wetland scientists, uh, land surveyors, uh, and, um, and the like. And we uh, uh, were hired by the Federer family uh, to work with uh, Ted and the rest of the team to come up with a uh, site plan uh, that uh, <coughs> Uh, that we believe uh, uh, fits the site. Uh, we've been working at this uh, now for um, for quite a while. It's been over a year and a half, uh, and a, a number of concept plans uh, have been generated over time. And I know Ted went into some detail on the project, and uh, I'm just going to dive in a, in a little bit more detail. And we have some uh, some plans that are colored up uh, that will make it a little bit easier to understand the project and exactly where we are in town. Uh, and so without further ado, here's, a, here's quite an a, a aerial overview here of the site. Uh, the site, the two parcels, 
our lot A, which is the smaller parcel, Lakeview Avenue, this is uh, Eaton, and then our lot B uh, to the south. And so we're tucked away uh, here in the southeast corner of, of Redding. And this is Walker's Brook. You can see the dark line that uh, borders our uh, project just to the east of our site and just to the south here. And then up, up much higher than us, of course, is the uh, uh, Jordans and Home Depot and the Walker's uh, Brook Plaza that, uh, that Ted uh, described in his presentation. We are, uh, the location of the property uh, gives us uh, the ability to, um, uh, can you just back up one more? Uh, thanks, Jesse. Um, we're walking distance um, along uh, Lakeview Avenue uh, over to the Market Basket Plaza. It's a, it's a pretty good clip. It's about a third of a mile walk. Uh, by car, we're about half a mile down to the exit at 128. Uh, and Salem Five Bank um, is, is right up here, which is right at the end of uh, Lakeview Avenue. So we're going to zoom in now and just take a closer look at the site. So we've zoomed in. Uh, here's our lot A and our lot B. And over to the right here uh, is a couple of aerial shots of the existing uh, conditions. And they're taken at a couple of different views, and I'll, I'll explain uh, how we're looking at this site. So if you travel, if you start over at Walker's Brook and you come down Lakeview Avenue, down to the end of the site, uh, at the very end of Lakeview, uh, the first aerial view up here is a, uh, is a shot, an aerial shot um, up in the sky here, looking back, uh, if you will, up Lakeview Avenue. So if you come up here, uh, this is the end of Lakeview Avenue, and we're looking back. You can see where Eaton, Eaton Ave takes a turn to the north. Uh, and I just wanted to describe to you uh, the, uh, a little bit about the existing conditions. This is the Lakeview Avenue parcel uh, that we identify as 23-25 Lakeview Avenue. Uh, this is a, a big commercial garage uh, that's in the middle of the property. There's also a single-family home and a two-family home. Uh, and uh, the rest of the property... Uh, much of the rest of the property is, uh, is, is bare and open uh, and has been used as a contractor's yard uh, for a number of years. Uh, most recently by the um, uh, pride of the Kudera family, the, uh, the Zani family operated their site work construction company uh, and used this as a, as a contractor's yard for years. Uh, and then uh, now the Kudera family uh, uh, keeps uh, their heavy equipment uh, on site. Uh, and maintains and operates the garage and, and has these two rental properties on the lake you have. I'll describe uh, the zoning uh, on the next slide in just a minute, uh, but on the Eaton, Ave on the Eaton Street side, uh, you can see the existing uh, two-family home here, uh, and the rest, of the, property, uh, rest of the property is vacant. The aerial view down below is, uh, is taken from a different perspective. Uh, we've traveled up Eaton Street a little bit here, and uh, we're up in the sky again about here, but now looking back uh, towards the intersection of Lakeview. Uh, so a little bit down the road here, looking back at the intersection of Lakeview and Eaton, and it's a little bit of a different perspective. You can get a better look at uh, the Eaton Street parcel and the uh, two-family home here, uh, and uh, just a different look at the, uh, the two residential structures in the front of the Lakeview Avenue piece and the commercial garage. This also gives you, both of these views also give you an idea of um, uh, the proximity of the Lakeview Avenue apartment uh, complex, which is a 96 unit uh, apartment complex right next door to us, um, uh, just to the west. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is our index plan, which is the first sheet in our site plan set, and we superimposed um, an, aerial, uh, an aerial over the uh, the assessor's information, and we've also superimposed uh, zoning information. And I re remember that Attorney Rick Nante mentioned that um, one of the parcels on the, lake, the Lakeview side is zoned partially industrial and partially residential. And so uh, here's the zone line between industrial and S15. S15 is the single family, uh, uh, 15,000 square foot zone. So about 40% of the parcel, excuse me, about 60% of the parcel is zoned residential and 40 is, uh, is zoned industrial, and all of lot A is zoned S15 uh, residential. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is our existing conditions plan. Uh, we have some, uh, some better color plans that, that, um, that will come a little bit later, but we've blown up uh, the site a little bit more. What we're looking at here is lot A, 
which is the lot on Eaton Street. And uh, the purpose of this plan, it'll show up a little bit better on the, the color version of the proposed conditions plan. We have the existing two-family home. And as Attorney Rignanti mentioned, and you, as you saw in the aerial, we're bordered on two sides by uh, Walker's Brook, uh, a man-made canal. And along Walker's Brook, uh, there is a, a floodplain. Uh, so uh, in that 1% chance storm event, uh, so any, in any given year, there's a 1% chance that we could get a 7-inch rainfall. That's the so-called 100-year uh, storm event. And um, with our topographic survey, we identified uh, where that elevation is uh, that corresponds with uh, FEMA's flood insurance rate maps. Uh, that, uh, that means that our property has uh, the, the ability to flood to elevation 84, which is this dark line here, on uh, the river, if you will, being, uh, being over here. So over on the Eaton Street side, uh, the floodplain does creep up onto the lot a little bit. In addition, the other wetland resource that borders uh, Walker's Brook is a bordering vegetated wetland uh, that most of us are familiar with. And that, the limit of that wetland is also shown on this plan. It's a little bit lower, a little bit closer to the river, um, at, uh, to Walker's Brook, than the floodplain. So next slide uh, shows the lot B across the street, uh, this rectangle. Uh, shape here. And in this case, uh, Walker's Brook uh, to the south and to the east here. Uh, we also have a, a floodplain line, which is the dark line here, and a wetland line, uh, but they're just about uh, off of the site. Uh, but because uh, we're working within 100 feet of these wetland resources, uh, it's going to require us to make a filing with the Conservation Commission under the Wetlands Protection Act. Uh, and that filing is, uh, is going to be a, uh, as a notice of intent. And I'll go into that in a little bit more detail when I talk about stormwater management. The next uh, slide is going to uh, take us down Lakeview Avenue. So our site, our lot B, is over here. And if we were to take a left out of the site, uh, we would pass. Um, uh, that label is, uh, is wrong. That's not Eaton Street. That's Beach Street. Um, this is uh, Beach Street here as we're coming down uh, and taking the bend. Uh, down to Walker's Brook Drive here. And this, uh, this slide is important. We've done an extensive topographic survey, as Attorney Rignanti uh, mentioned, from our property line, which is about here, uh, down Lakeview Avenue to Walker's Brook is approximately uh, 790 feet or so. So this is the section of roadway improvement that is away from the frontage of our property that, that the Frederick family is proposing as an off-site improvement. And we've been working closely with um, uh, DBW and Ryan Percival at the engineering department about uh, uh, exactly what standard is going to be expected for improving the road. So it's going to be full depth reclamation. So all of the pavement will be ground up and the road will essentially be rebuilt uh, along with curbing and a sidewalk along one side of the street. And in return, uh, what the Federer family uh, is, is asking uh, the town of Reading, um, if, that, if that road is improved to, the, to an acceptable standard, uh, that, uh, that the town accepted as a public way. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, as, we, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, uh, we've been at this uh, for over a year and a half now, and we've gone through a number of uh, different concept plans uh, that eventually arrived at the current one, uh, which is 120 units. Uh, you may recall Attorney Rignanti mentioned that we had filed with Mass Housing before we came to you for a project eligibility letter. And at that time, uh, we had uh, submitted a plan that was a little bit, a little bit different than the one that we submitted uh, uh, to the ZBA. Uh, the plan that was submitted initially to Mass Housing was a 160-unit uh, uh, concept plan. After some, after some meetings, uh, a technical review meeting here in town, and, and bouncing it uh, across town officials, uh, we realized that uh, after talking to some public safety officials about access around the buildings and that sort of thing, that uh, we thought it best uh, to revise the plan uh, to provide a better uh, access around the site. I'll go into some of those details in a minute. Uh, but we've gone through a, a, quite a number of different um, concepts. At one time we had 180 units. We had another concept uh, that was as many as 300 units. Um, but we've been at this, as I said, for a while. And, and after, after about a year and a half, um, we believe that, that we've really drilled down uh, to something that works uh, with the existing topography uh, and uh, fits, into the, fits into the neighborhood, um, taking, uh, taking everything into context. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, 
uh, color rendering uh, that shows the layout of the proposed site. As Attorney Rick Nanti mentioned, we're proposing uh, 120 units in three buildings, and each of the buildings are identical, and they're shown in uh, these brown rectangles. Uh, this is the Eaton Street uh, parcel. And the grays, the gray colors that you see on the plan, we have a couple of different uh, shades. Uh, the darker shade of gray is the existing edge of pavement on Lakeview and Eaton. And this is the proposed roadway improvement um, in Lakeview that will allow us to connect uh, the two projects together. And then, of course, uh, we're providing for 24-foot wide access driveways around uh, the entire uh, buildings on Lot A and similarly uh, around the proposed uh, buildings on Lot B. We have, uh, as Attorney Rick Nanti mentioned, a series of uh, surface parking spaces and uh, the nice thing about the project is, is that we also have um, one story of parking under and on each of the three buildings, which, which allows for covered parking. Um, there is a handicap accessible space underneath each one of the buildings as well. The small block on Lot B is the community building that uh, Attorney Rignati mentioned. Uh, our architect will go into a little bit of detail on, on how we're proposing to use this space. And some of the other grays that you see um, that show connections on the site are uh, proposed sidewalks. So in front of each one of the properties is a sidewalk along the street. Uh, there are sidewalks in front of the building on uh, Lakeview. Uh, and there are also sidewalks along the parking fields on both um, sides of the two buildings on the lot of the lot B. And of course, uh, in the, the middle or courtyard area, and there are also a series of sidewalks that run uh, uh, two units that are um, on either side uh, of the courtyard. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, uh, this, is, uh, this is our utility plan, and I'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but um, as, we, uh, as we came about and, and designed our uh, stormwater management system, uh, we also dug a series of test holes throughout both of the sites. Uh, so one of our approved, um, our, D our DEP approved soil evaluators went out to the site. Uh, and we dug a series of 10 uh, test holes um, on both sites, a total of 10. Uh, and the purpose of those test holes, uh, they were done with an excavator and we dug down uh, either 10 feet below the surface or until we had uh, physical groundwater that we could see. And the reason uh, for doing that is we needed to determine what the texture of the soil was so that we knew how well it could accept stormwater runoffs, that we could size our stormwater management areas appropriately, and most importantly, to establish where the estimated seasonal high groundwater table is in the spring. And there's a methodology for doing that uh, that approved soil evaluators use. And we use that information uh, to establish not only where we were gonna place our stormwater management systems, but also to determine the, the elevation of the buildings to protect them from um, any possibility of uh, flooding from uh, rising groundwater. Those test holes uh, were excavated back in October of 2016, and we did some more work uh, most recently in December of uh, 17 as we finalized our, our submittal for the comp permit. During our uh, drainage design, we also look at regional soils maps uh, that tell us um, regionally uh, uh, there's a, there are soil surveys that tell us what the texture of the soils uh, are like in the area, and sometimes they jive with the on-site soil, sometimes they don't. Uh, in this case, uh, we were uh, pleased to find out that the regional soils maps, uh, which call for uh, a particular soil called Merrimack soils, which are typically very sandy, uh, matched very closely to the actual soils that we encountered when we uh, dug our test holes. Almost all of our test holes were very consistent, uh, and they were um, uh, different uh, grain sizes of sand. Uh, so they were sands and loamy sands, uh, which are very favorable for allowing water to infiltrate back into the ground. <coughs> So, let me continue and talk a little bit about our utilities. Uh, Attorney Rignati mentioned that, that, um, that there appears to be adequate access to all the utilities that will need to support the site. Uh, and just to go into it in a little bit more detail, uh, there's an existing uh, water, uh, town water distribution system that comes down Lakeview and it tees off to a hydrant, an existing hydrant that's located right at the end of Lakeview Avenue today, right where I'm pointing. And then uh, the, the uh, town water system continues in a pipe down, uh, down Eaton Ave. 
So we're scheduled, um, we're trying to schedule some time if we can get out of this cold weather with DPW uh, and engineering to come out and do a hydrant flow test. Uh, during that hydrant flow test, uh, what we'll do is we'll determine uh, what the capacity is uh, and just verify that uh, there is enough uh, pressure and fire flow uh, to support our buildings. But our proposal is very simply to tap in uh, to the existing water main on Lakeview uh, that will run to the uh, to one of four sprinkler rooms. One that will be associated with, uh, with one of the buildings on Lot B, the second building, the community building, and the building on Eaton Avenue. Uh, we'll have fire lines that will come into the sprinkler room, and then domestic lines, which will be smaller, that will serve uh, the folks that live there. Similarly, uh, there is a sewer available to us on Lakeview. Uh, the sewer main in the existing condition at stops right about here. So uh, it flows, if you will, in this direction back towards Walkersburg Drive. And so what we're proposing to do, uh, if you can see the plan, it's the reddish color. Uh, we're proposing to extend uh, the sewer about 300 feet or so uh, to this point here. And that'll be a new 8-inch um, uh, PVC sewer main uh, that will uh, we'll stub off with uh, all brand new services uh, that will service each of, the, each of the buildings and you can see the, the, service, the proposed service connections. Uh, because we have underground parking, uh, the underground parking areas will have to have um, uh, what's referred to as an, an NDC gas trap that will uh, also be connected to the, uh, to the town's uh, sewer system. Gas, fuel, uh, natural gas is available to us. Uh, it's uh, located currently at the intersection of Lakeview and Beach. And so the proposal would be to run uh, natural gas uh, down to the site with the help of the, uh, of the local utility company. We have a series of above ground utility poles uh, and there's three phase power that comes right through the, right down Lakeview Avenue, continues out uh, into the wetland out here. Uh, and so we'll be working closely uh, with Reading Municipal Light on finding an appropriate location uh, for transformers that will serve uh, the three buildings. So the last item, uh, uh, one of the last items I wanted to talk about, which are one of the most important things, is uh, our stormwater management system. And what we've done, and what we do on every project, is we take a look at the existing conditions first. And because we're working within 100 feet of a wetland, we know right away that we're, uh, that we're required to meet DEP stormwater management standards. And there are 10 of them. And those, um, those are outlined in a special form that we submit along with our stormwater report to the Conservation Commission when we file. And the idea is, uh, in the Act and the regulations in the Stormwater Handbook, is that if you meet all the 10 standards that uh, your project, the understanding is that your project is protecting the interests of the Act. And so in those 10 standards, it talks about not creating new uncontrolled discharges, making sure that your peak flow isn't greater I mean, once you're done with the project as compared to the peak flow that leaves the site in the existing condition, making sure that we're recharging groundwater back into the ground um, to offset the uh, additional hardscape that we're proposing. Uh, sometimes you're, we are, uh, we're doing projects in a critical area or a project that um, has a higher pollutant load rate, like a big shopping plaza, for example, um, with a lot of cars. Uh, you have to treat uh, that water that comes off the parking lot to a little bit of a higher standard. That's not us on this project. It's a smaller residential uh, style project. We are not in a critical area, which most oftentimes is associated with the groundwater protection district um, or surface water protection district. We're not in any of those protective zones. And so the, the rules in the handbook are pretty clear uh, what you have to do to make sure that you're recharging and then treating the water that comes off of the parking lot. And so what we're proposing to do for treatment involves a certain chain of devices. And the ones that we've chosen for this project include uh, deep sump catch basins, which will collect water directly from the parking lot. They'll go to an oil grit separator, which is um, a lot like a septic tank. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with septic systems, that'll remove some additional sediment before going on uh, to four subsurface infiltration um, galleries. And so these are chambers, plastic chambers, that are going to be placed under the parking lot in a couple of locations. So there's one proposed uh, over in this area here, uh, one that's mirrored on this side, and then similarly uh, uh, the third one is, uh, is located under the parking field over in this area. 
So through the use of these underground chambers, we're able to hold the water back and let it out a little bit slowly to match uh, the existing peak flow, and that's how we're able to meet that particular standard. Now, the other thing that um, we were asked to do, and uh, after having met with uh, Ryan uh, Percival after a couple of our DRT meetings, is you may have heard uh, some talk about the Massachusetts small MS4 general permit requirements that are coming out, which are going to require cities and towns to start sampling some of their stormwater management areas and detention basins for phosphorus and some other contaminants of concern. So Ryan asked us to uh, to get ahead of it, uh, but the, uh, the regulations haven't been uh, put in place yet. There was a delay, uh, but we've provided in our stormwater report uh, some phosphorus load calculations for the particular devices that we chose to show him how he will be able to take credit for our site uh, as he um, needs to tally up um, of these types of phosphorus removal systems for new construction in the town of Reading going forward. Uh, so we'll be a little bit ahead of the game and he'll have some credit in the bank uh, should this project go forward. Uh, so next, next slide. We do, uh, and let's go one more. Um, and I didn't color up um, the proposed lighting plan or the landscaping plan at this, uh, at this time, uh, but this is our, our lighting plan and our approach to lighting uh, was uh, is pretty simple. We're using um, an LED LED type pole mounted uh, lighting fixtures. Uh, we have a, one of our professional engineers in the office uh, uh, specializes in our lighting designs, and we have a program that helps us uh, make sure that the lights are balanced. And uh, the program helps us space the lighting appropriately, and to make sure that we most importantly that we're not spilling light over onto uh, onto neighboring properties. And so uh, this plan shows that. Uh, there's a summary of the light poles and the styles of the heads. And then, uh, for example, up on lot A, we have four uh, proposed uh, street uh, lights uh, that are pole mounted. And then over on lot B, there are a few more. There are eight altogether, with the eighth one being uh, lighting up uh, in between the buildings. The next plan is our landscaping plan. And we show it on two sheets so that we can blow it up and show it in a little bit more detail, this being lot A which I believe is um, probably the more, or the more critical, uh, critical one in terms of screening, helping screen the project from some of our uh, direct abutters, uh, especially uh, the gentleman that was here at number 114. Uh, we're proposing a, a, a short retaining wall along this property line and a row of dark American green on uh, uh, along here. There are 17 of them that are proposed here. Uh, All together, I think at this point, uh, there are about 40 trees that we're proposing to uh, uh, to plant as part of the project, and then a slew of shrubs and that sort of thing. Uh, but there's a there's a pl there's a key that describes it. And if we go go to the next slide, Jesse, uh, this is the landscaping plan that, uh, that that shows the detail for lot B. Uh, this is another property line that we that we have here that we share with the Lakeview Apartments, the 96 units over here. Uh, there is a, a relatively new stockade fence that the Lakeview Apartments put up not too long ago. It looks looks very nice, and where and this is a little bit of a grass strip that we're proposing here. We we've been going back and forth. We initially landscaped it fully, and then realized that um, this would probably be a really good place for snow storage, and so we've taken off uh, any uh, any plantings here, uh, and primarily because there's already a nice uh, screening fence here, and so. And so that's our idea for snow storage on this part of the site here. We have a couple of other areas identified, but as you can see, uh, we are uh, constrained because of one of the things that we're trying to do with our limit of work is to honor uh, the CONCOM's uh, local bylaw requirement of uh, the 25 foot no disturbed zone that they have. They have a 25 foot zone of natural vegetation that they want us to try to maintain. It's a local bylaw, something that we could ask a waiver from uh, but we've tried very hard to uh, to honor it, and we are honoring it with this plan. Uh, and so, uh, between the location of the wetland resources and uh, trying to meet that setback requirement, we don't have a lot of room on site. And what I was trying to get at is if this this particular snow storage area and a couple of the others that we're proposing uh, between the two sites were to fill up, uh, the federers are already willing and able uh, to truck snow excess snow off site. They own other properties um, that are nearby and have the ability to take snow off-site if, uh, if need be. So that concludes my civil presentation.
Uh, Ted, I don't know if you want to move on to the next person or Mr. Chair. Uh, I think we, we'd probably like to finish the whole thing and then, uh, okay. David, can you make it as short as possible? <laughs> Uh, Chairman, board members, thank you for having us. Well, I'm David DiBenedetto, project designer. I'm here with architect Frank Curtis from Curtis DiBenedetto Associates. And uh, just go ahead. Uh, I'll, if we do the site. Um, as, it, as it's been mentioned, uh, our site consists of two lots. We're calling lot A and lot B. Lot A having one structure consisting of about 50,000 square feet, a total of 40 units in a mixture of one, two, and three bedroom units. Uh, some of the, we do have some walkways encouraging use of some of the features on, on the site plan, such as the, the proposed park area, uh, as well as the community center or the community building, which would house a uh, package concierge. Uh, uh, facility office and some recreation room as well as well as a play area behind it uh, lot B has two additional two structures which are very similar to the one on lot A consisting of about 50,000 gross square feet of uh, building with uh, uh, 30 units in each uh, each building which a total of 120 units uh, there is parking on the surface as has been mentioned as well as below, below uh, uh, grade parking as well. Uh, the site, the part of the site naturally lends itself to have uh, a lower level that's exposed almost a full story on the rear. And at, at the front of uh, the street side of the building, it's about four stories. And the rear would be about five stories. Uh, again, with lake view as well, the, this particular topography of the site kind of uh, works its way up to a high point and then works its way back down and we're proposing to, to, to grade up so that this will have uh, a four-story appearance on the, on the street side and about a five-story appearance on the rear end side. And, and in the interior portion of that site where we have our playground and, and, and our walkways and our community center, that would be at about four story, uh, four stories on each side with uh, walkout units to encourage that residential feel. Um, you may not see it here, but uh, we were trying to stop our building as close to, um, there's, there's an industrial sort of uh, application here, or structures on, on this on this site to give it that uh, industrial feel. We were trying to line up our, our building so that we would sort of stop where that industrial stru looking structure ends as well. Um, if we move to the next slide. Our units, our units count consists of 10 three-bedroom units, about 1,251 uh, 1, square feet, our uh, 54 two-bedroom units at an average about 1,070 square feet, and 54 one-bedroom units that average about 780 square feet. 10 units per level, and a total of four units per uh, four floors per uh, building of units. Uh, we're using it again. This sort of shows our, uh, our building heights on this to the elevation here on the rear of the building here. For example, at Eaton Street, we have a five-story um, facade with entry to our parking level below. Okay. Um, we, we are using a different um, different uh, materials to, to, to promote some depth to the structure so it's not just a plain facade or a flat plane. Um, we're proposing, uh, and I think we've, we've talked about using a, a hardy board or a cementitious uh, siding instead of a vinyl siding to promote you know, sustainability and uh, as well as composite trim paneling. Um, and some cedar impressions, as well as uh, a stone veneer on the on the lower level, just kind of defining the base of the building. Um, again, you can see here how the topography lends itself to be at roughly four stories on the on the, for example, on the Eaton Street side here, and five stories on the on the rear of the project. Um, 
some of the colors that we've chosen, uh, we chose a, a lighter color to just soften the massing of the structure, as well as uh, you know, defining that base of the structure with uh, some stone veneer to, to, to break up the height of that building. We are promoting, uh, and several units have these, these walkout style uh, apartments <coughs> to promote that residential feel. And we took some of the elements from the neighborhood, for example, the, uh, the pitched ceilings, uh, the, the, the siding, uh, and some of the cedar and stone elements from the neighborhood to, to kind of create a cohesiveness with the neighborhood as well as um, our, our, our pitch roof here on the top is mainly screening for our rooftop units as well. So it's not a full pitched uh, roof. Uh, there is a, a depressed area in there for, for creating screening as well. I think. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Kim? Again, keep it as short as you I'm can. Gonna, I'm going to let you do the slides. Okay. Does anybody have a... Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Kim Hazavardian, a traffic engineer with TEP LLC out of uh, Salem, New Hampshire and North Andover. Uh, some background on myself. Uh, I, I'm coming up on 37 years of doing this. I uh, hold a bachelor's and master's from the University of Kansas in civil engineering and a PhD in uh, transportation from U.S. Amherst. I'm a PE uh, and a certified professional traffic operations engineer. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I put together the traffic impact and access study, and it's uh, a standard Massachusetts type uh, study. Uh, it's been uh, reviewed by the neighbors already. We've gotten comments, and uh, I'm presuming it's going to also be going to a peer review consultant. We'll get comments from them as well. Uh, we worked out the scope for the traffic impact study uh, in consultation with uh, the police department and the town engineer. Uh, and uh, let me just show you what we studied. Uh, we analyzed uh, the Eaton Street Pleasant Street <coughs> four-way stop intersection. Uh, we analyzed the side driveways. Uh, we analyzed the Lakeview and Walkersbrook Drive intersection, uh, and we analyzed the uh, John Street and Walkersbrook Drive intersection. Uh, we analyzed uh, the weekday AM peak hour, the weekday PM peak hour, the Saturday midday peak hour. Uh, we considered 2017 existing conditions, uh, 2024 no build conditions, which include an annual background growth rate of 1% a year, uh, plus uh, a particular uh, project that the uh, town staff uh, asked us to include. Uh, and then we analyzed the 2024 build condition. Uh, and the 2024 build condition adds traffic due to the project. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we took traffic counts uh, using uh, automatic traffic recorders on uh, Eaton and Lakeview uh, near the site. Uh, we took intersection counts at the study area intersections for the three periods I mentioned. Uh, and uh, if you look at uh, the uh, volumes on Eden and Lakeview near the site, they are low, uh, roughly uh, 200 vehicles on uh, Eaton over the course of a day, and roughly uh, 250 uh, on Lakeview over the course of the day. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we had a speed study uh, on uh, Eaton and Lakeview, and uh, the unposted speed limit is uh, 30 miles an hour. Uh, and we got speeds uh, in the range of 20 miles an hour for an average speed and uh, 85th percentile speed, so the speed is exceeded by 15% of the uh, observed vehicles uh, in the 20s. Now, uh, that speed is on the uh, part where essentially uh, Lakeview and Eaton have a bend in it, so that's going to hold down speeds. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, just as a sample, uh, and I might not run through every one of the slides on existing volumes, <coughs> Uh, but if you look, and I'm going to try to correlate uh, the diagram on the right with the mapping on the left. The diagram on the right looks like a, a box. Everything is at 90 degree angles and uh, the sides are all equal and that's to make it readable. Uh, I want to correlate that slide with what's in the figure on the left. Okay, there's the intersection of Lakeview and Walkersbrook Drive and I'll just move the pointer there. There's the intersection of John Street and uh, Walkersbrook Drive, and I'll move the pointer there. Uh, and uh, the four-way stop, Pleasant and Eaton, 
is right there. And uh, you can see that Walkersburg Drive carries, uh, considering more traffic than the other roads in the study area, we're talking rough numbers, a thousand vehicles during the peak hour, maybe more in some locations. Uh, and you can see Lakeview and Pleasant carry much lower volumes uh, in the uh, double digits per direction. So this is for the uh, AM peak hour. If you just quickly flip to the PM peak hour, uh, in the interest of uh, not taking too much time, you can see busy on Walkersburg Drive, not so busy on uh, on Eaton, Pleasant, and Lakeview. And uh, same thing for the Saturday, which you can just flip through quickly. Okay, now, uh, now let's go to the next slide. Uh, we looked at uh, crash history in the area. And this crash history is for the uh, Walkersburg Drive, uh, John Street intersection. Let me back up a little bit. The way we got the crash history was we got the five most recent years of available data. Uh, for mass DOT, uh, and uh, that data query came up with uh, crashes at the Walkersburg Drive and John Street intersection and uh, the intersection on the next slide. But looking at Walkersburg and John, uh, over the five years, uh, there were seven uh, crashes, uh, and um, that works out over, over the five years to an average of 1.4 crashes per year. Uh, we did a calculation to um, see what that translated to in terms of accidents per million entering vehicles and the number we came up with was 0.28 crashes per million entering vehicles. Uh, that compares with mass DOT averages of 0.56 to 0.58 crashes per million entering vehicles. So the crash rate at that intersection based on the mass DOT data is roughly half the crash rate per million entering vehicles uh, than the uh, mass DOT averages. Next slide, please. Uh, we got the crashes as well at, as, at the Walkersburg Drive Lakeview Avenue intersection. And over the five years, there were three crashes. That works out to 0.6 per year. The crash rate works out to 0.12 per million entering vehicles, uh, which is less than the average run signalized intersections, uh, ranging from 0.56 to 0.58. Uh, and those are the two locations where the quarry pulled up accidents. Uh, the other locations didn't show accidents. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, we looked at site distances uh, for the site drivers, and I'm not going to belabor the slide. Uh, the site distances are adequate. Next slide, please. Uh, we have three slides that deal with uh, the 2024 Nobel traffic volumes. One is for the AM peak hour. That's showing now. There's another one for the PM peak hour, another one for Saturday peak hour. And essentially what we did was uh, we increased the traffic by 1% the year. Uh, going out for seven years, uh, which is a pretty typical thing to do. And then um, we included one background growth project, which was uh, a redevelopment, uh, I think it was 467 Main Street, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, so why don't we skip through the next couple of slides. Okay, now we're getting into uh, the site traffic. All right, so the 2024 no build is future without the site. Now let's start adding site traffic. Uh, and let's look at existing conditions first. Uh, the site exists as a combination of, I believe, five residential units uh, and an industrial use, the yard. And uh, you can see there are trucks on the side, uh, garage type or industrial type building. And this is uh, an aerial from uh, Google Earth from 2013 that showed what was going on on the site. You can see trucks over there. You can see materials stockpiled, other vehicles around this building. Uh, so that's what is slash was on the site. Next slide, please. Now, these numbers are proposed site trips, uh, and I'm going to tell you how I calculated those in a minute. Uh, the bottom line is those previous trips would be going away and would be replaced by these trips. Now, sometimes when you do a traffic impact study, you take the difference between the previous <coughs> trips and the proposed trips. Here, we didn't do that. We're assuming they're all new trips. We didn't take any old traffic away from the network, and we didn't take away the old trucks from the network. All right, we're just adding the new traffic, not taking away the old. Uh, and if you look at the numbers, um, I'm going to focus in on the peak hours. Uh, first of all, where do the numbers come from? The numbers came from the Institute of Transportation Engineers Trip Generation Manual. Uh, it's a standard way of calculating a trip generation. The numbers in that manual are based on real-world traffic counts at real-world apartment complexes, and they give you uh, information like how many trips per unit uh, are calculated uh, for the uh, weekday, for the weekday AM peak hour, the weekday PM peak hour. Uh, in the case of this uh, 
tabulation Saturday daily and Saturday psychic <coughs> hour as well. Uh, and you can see that during the peak hours we're talking roughly 60 to 80 something vehicle trips. Now, there are 120 units in there. Why isn't it 120 vehicle trips in an hour? Because uh, we're looking at the street peak hour, one, one hour. Not all of the trips in and out happen in one hour. If someone's going uh, to work, let's say, some of them might leave at uh, 6 to 7, some might leave 7 to 8, some might leave 8 to 9. So the trips are spread out. All 120 units don't, uh, don't leave in the same hour. That's why the numbers are what they are. Uh, if you look at the numbers, 60, uh, I'm going to go to the uh, busiest of the three peak hours, the weekday p.m. peak hour, 84 vehicle trips. As an example, it's split 54 into the site, people coming home from work, and 30 leaving the site, adding up to 84. That 84 is roughly a little more than one vehicle a minute, but that's split by direction in versus out, and it's split over the road network, uh, which I'm going to get to in the next slide. Uh, next slide shows our estimated uh, site traffic distribution, and we've assigned uh, the highest percentage, 40%, to uh, Walkersburg Drive to and from the south, 35% to and from Walkersburg Drive to the north, and 25% uh, uh, on Eaton Street to and from the north. Now, it's an estimation. Uh, let's say the numbers change by 10%. If they change by 10%, looking at that busiest hour, that's 10% of 84 vehicles. That's eight trips swing one way or the other, which isn't going to make a significant difference. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we took uh, our no-build volumes to 2024, we, and uh, we needed to add the site traffic, uh, and this is the site traffic. These numbers of the site traffic spread over the network, uh, and I think we'll go to the PM peak hour just to keep it uh, consistent. Uh, PM peak hour is the busiest of the three peak hours. You can see all of the site trips are there, 54 in, 30 out, total of 84. Uh, and you can see when we spread the trips around the network, uh, the numbers at uh, Pleasant and uh, Eaton, the four-way stop, uh, work out to be uh, 7 to 14 added in, in various directions, per direction, so to speak. Uh, and then if you go out to um, Lakeview and Walker's Brook, uh, the numbers are 12 turning left out of Lakeview, 11 turning right out of left view, Lakeview. 22 coming in from Lakeview, uh, from Walker's Brook and turning right into Lakeview. 18 uh, turning left from Walker's Brook into Lakeview. And then go up to um, John Street in Walker's Brook. Uh, the numbers are uh, 18 and 11 added to that intersection per direction. So the numbers we're talking about are, in, in traffic engineering analysis terms, not large numbers. Uh, they're not, not 100 trips in an hour, they're, they're in the, uh, in the uh, 07, the 22 trips per movement per hour. Those are the sort of numbers we're talking about. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, good. Uh, why don't we go to the uh, PM, just to be consistent. Okay, so as a sample, we'll look at the uh, 2024 build, traffic volume, weekday PM peak hour. And this is uh, where we have all the numbers in there, all right? Uh, this is uh, the no-build traffic plus the site traffic, and you can see that Walkersburg Drive still has the larger numbers. It's the busiest, uh, and uh, I'd call it a high-volume road. Uh, and uh, Eaton Street and Lakeview Avenue have more traffic than they did under the existing condition. They have more traffic than they did under the 2024 no-build condition, which is added traffic not due to the project. And they have a little more traffic under the 2024 build condition but it's still a relatively low volume scenario. So Walkersburg Drive stays high volume as it was to begin with, and uh, Eaton Street and Lakeview stay relatively low volume as it was to begin with. Next slide, please. Okay, now we're gonna look at some traffic volume changes, and this basically looks uh, at the edges of the study area to see how many trips are entering and leaving the study area. Uh, and you can see the numbers are in the two digits. Uh, we're talking, um, 16 to 34 vehicle trips added uh, at each one of the edges of the study area. Walkersburg Drive north of John Street, Walkersburg Drive south of John Street, and Eaton Street north of Pleasant Street. Uh, and those numbers are split by direction. Uh, some will be going north, some will be going south, for example. And if you look, take a look at the 2024 no-build volumes and the 2024 build volumes with the project. 
the differences are not large. Walkers, Walkersburg Drive, busy to begin with, a little bit busier with the, with the project, but not much. Uh, Eaton Street, uh, the volumes go up, but they're still much lower uh, than Walkersburg Drive. All right, you can see, for example, 97 to 118, Eaton Street north of Pleasant Street during the weekday PM Street peak hour. Next slide, please. Okay, now let's get into one of the last steps of the analysis. That's doing the uh, capacity analysis. For the capacity analysis, we use the standard procedures in the uh, 2010 Highway Capacity Manual. Uh, we use the synchro capacity analysis software, which is also a standard. And a primary output is level of service. Uh, and uh, level of service simply is a index to a delay. If you have an average delay for a vehicle of 10 seconds or less, that's level of service A. Level of service B is 10 to 15 seconds. C is 15 to 25. D is 25 to 35, E is 35 to 50, and level of service F is greater than 50. Uh, and uh, usually I would consider level of service A to be a low delay scenario, uh, level of service C and D a moderate delay scenario, and level of service E and F delayed scenario. Okay, next slide please. Uh, this is an overview of um, what's going on with respect to capacity analysis. And uh, first I'll look at the intersections on um, Walkersburg Drive. I'll start with Walkersburg Drive and John Street. Uh, and you can see what's going on there is the left turns from Walkersburg Drive to John Street are working with low delays with or without the project. Level of service A. Uh, the movements out of John Street are working with delays with the project. Uh, and uh, without the project, I mean, uh, they have with delay, it's operating with delays with or without the project, in fact, under existing conditions. Um, that's an existing condition. This is not going to change markedly because of the project. There are going to be more vehicles there. There's going to be an uptick in delay, but it's still going to be the same order of magnitude, the same character of operation as you have uh, without the project. Uh, now let's look at Walkersburg Drive and Lakeview Avenue. If you look at the uh, level of service there, if you're making a, so uh, a left turn from Walkersburg Drive, uh, you see level of service A. I think that's my phone hearing me talk. Uh, and um, let me do a search for an answer to electric drive. <laughs> <laughs> that is my phone. Next time I'm going to have to shut it off all the way. Um, hopefully it doesn't say any more. <laughs> Now take a look at the levels of service. This is a movement out of Walkersburg Drive. Uh, we're talking level of service C to D. Uh, and uh, it's C under the existing conditions. Then under the no-build conditions, uh, you have uh, level of service C in the morning peak hour and D in the, uh, in the weekday PM and Saturday peak hour. And then uh, you have level of service D across the board uh, during the uh, weekday PM peak hour, excuse me, during all the peak hours. Okay, so bottom line, you, you have a level of service C to D, and the only time it changes due to the project is during the weekday AM peak hour, it goes from C to D, uh, but it's a minor change because the delay only goes up about seven seconds. All right, so that's what we have there. Uh, now that intersection is the one that's immediately <coughs> adjacent to the, uh, the general way intersection. So when you're at that intersection, uh, when you're making the left out, you have to you have to pay extra attention. Uh, there there are other things going on you have to be cognizant of, uh, and that's an existing condition and one that will continue. Uh, if you look at the other intersections, at the Eaton Street Pleasant Street four-way stop, it's level of service A across the board, and if you look at um, Lakeview in the site driveway, it's level of service A across the board. And on site driveways, I just combined all the volumes into one driveway uh, to load everything in as as severely as I could, it was still level of service A. Next slide, please. Uh, so in conclusion, all right, first of all, safety. Uh, based on what we've seen, there are low crash rates uh, in the area, in the traffic study area, and the additional traffic is not going to change that. Uh, it's not going to change the nature of traffic safety. Uh, as far as traffic operations go, we do not anticipate a significant impact on traffic operations. The things that work well now will continue to work well. 
The things, the things that are more challenging will continue to work more challenging, but the project isn't going to break them. Um, as far as um, industrial traffic goes, right now that site has industrial traffic and trucks. That will go away and be replaced with residential traffic. Uh, then, as far as improvements related to the project, uh, Lakeview Avenue is to be reconstructed. Uh, I don't believe that the volume increase uh, requires that reconstruction. Could that road handle the traffic from an, a traffic engineering point of view? Yes, but the road is going to be reconstructed and a new sidewalk is going to go in. Um, as far as conditions along Walkersbrook Drive, uh, particularly Lakeview uh, Avenue intersection area, uh, the applicant is willing to contribute to a study of potential improvements by others. In other words, uh, beyond the scope of what this project would do, uh, but the applicant's willing to contribute to a study uh, for that area. Uh, and Town of Reading input, again, we uh, develop the scope in consultation with Town of Reading staff, uh, and we're going to work with the, uh, the peer review traffic consultant going forward. Uh, also, regarding local outreach, uh, the developer has met with local residents uh, and uh, gotten uh, input of traffic concerns, and uh, we've gotten more, more feedback, the 21-page report, uh, and uh, the Town peer review consultant will be involved, so we'll be dealing with all that going forward. And that concludes my presentation. Uh, Ed, do you want to say anything? No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, then that concludes our presentation. Sorry we ran over a bit. I first asked the board members if they had any uh, comments or uh, questions for the applicant. Um, Robert, do you want to speak? No. Yeah, sure. Uh, I have a number of things. Obviously, this is the first time we've heard detailed <coughs> information on it. Uh, maybe if you put the one of the slides back up, could you could you do that uh, so people could see it? And what I'd like is the side view of, of the, you know, Eaton Street and, and Lake View, uh, the, the site plan. Yeah, something like that. That's fine. Uh, one of, the, one of the things that strikes me, and I heard it mentioned there, was the, the, the height of the buildings and the density of it. I, I do not see a lot of green space, and I know you've talked, oh, we're going to do a park, uh, we're going to work with CONCOM, etc., etc. But I, I look at it, and I do not see a lot of green space at all. I see no details at all in regards to this, so the, the park that you, you were talking about, a playground or, or what it is. And, and I think the residents would need more amenities in regards to that, in to, to green space, maybe walking paths and, and things such as this. Uh, you know, landscape areas, uh, picnic area or something to, to that effect uh, on it. And I, I think one way to maybe obtain that is by lessening the density. Now, whether it's, it's remove a floor or so on each building, uh, I did not like hearing, you know, we get four, it's going to look like a four-story building from the front, but from the back, it's going to be a five-story building. Uh, look, it just, just sounds way out of character for that area on it. Uh, another question, uh, and I have, and, and I need to clarify it, on the working with the town on the reconstruction of Lakeview Avenue. Is that to go all the way down to Walker's Brook Drive, that reconstruction of Lakeview? Yes, that's yes. correct. Okay, so so that will include that. And then the other thing then that, that concerns me is once it gets to uh, Walker's Brook Drive, and we have, that's a signalized intersection there, or you will be entering, oh, uh, let's say the, the a signal in the area of a signalized intersection. I don't believe Lakeview right now is controlled by signals, but it's right there. It's in the proximity, and I think some work needs to be done in regards to how this is all going to work, tying in to a signalized intersection uh, at, at Walker's Brook Drive, Market Basket entrance there, that, that whole intersection there all needs to be to looked at and, and worked at. And I know you mentioned that you would be willing to work with the town on that in regards to doing something. Maybe that's what it needs, some modernization of those signals there uh, on that. 
Uh, another thing, when, when I was looking through it, and I know we've gone through this in other 40 Bs, John, is, mm -hmm. and we've done it before, is loading areas for each building. I mean, you're going to have people, it doesn't happen every day, people moving in and out, but you're going to have moving vans, or, or, even, or, or at the very least, a box truck for people moving in, people moving out, deliveries, etc. And, and I think we need a provision at each building where you're going to have people, uh, you know, moving into their apartments, into loading furniture, unloading furniture, etc. And, and another thing in this day and age is uh, daily deliveries to each building, to the occupants. Today's day and age, you see the FedEx trucks, the uh, UPS trucks, up and down your street. People do a lot more shopping today and have deliveries of cartons coming to their residences a lot more than they did 10 years ago, five years ago. And I think some provision needs to be made for that, or at least discuss it, tell us how it's going to work, etc. cetera, uh, on that. Uh, in regards to uh, utilities, uh, obviously we're going to have the town engineer will be looking at this and uh, I'll be looking to him in regards to, you know, what the utilities in the area will be able to uh, uh, take. Uh, uh, I'm going to imagine that the, the uh, wastewater would be okay. You say you're going to extend the sewer up there. I would suspect the sewer in Walkersbrook Drive should be able to handle the additional uh, wastewater from, eat from from this development. But this is something we'll uh, expect from the uh, town engineer, a letter on that. Uh, same thing uh, from other town agencies, fire chief, or yeah, the fire chief in regards to access to the building, uh, police chief, etc. Uh, and that's about what I thought of as I listened to the presentation, John. And obviously, as we get into this and, and go through each one, uh, or go through each meeting, uh, we'll get into certain items uh, a little deeper, et cetera. Uh, one issue, and maybe this is between the board members, maybe Chris will get, is I'm, I'm still a bit up in the air on this safe harbor. What, what are we- address that right now. That's what I'm gonna say. What are we gonna be doing that? Obviously, if this were, Tonight, we had 15 days to make a decision on that after opening up the meeting tonight. But I see we do have a letter from the applicant uh, on that, that he's willing to extend that till mm -hmm. to next year. And what are the ramifications? What's our advantage, disadvantage, et cetera, on this? So I think we need to some discussion on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Nick? Um, I'm going to save most of my comments and questions for later, but I did have a few questions. Um, given it was an industrial site, um, was there a phase one or any environmental review done of what's on the site right now? Chris? It's my understanding that a, a, a phase one or a, a 21E site assessment for phase one has been done uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the owners. Did that reveal anything? Not that I know of. That's not our area of expertise, uh, but I know it was uh, submitted, I believe, along with the, um, the project eligibility letter application that was submitted to Mass Housing. Well, we can submit it to the, to the board. That'd be great. All right. Um, I had a question about, uh, given the proximity to, you know, the floodplain and its propensity to flood, um, and that there's going to be underground parking, is it anticipated that the underground parking will flood at a 1% high flood event? Uh, so in short, no. And the reason we can say that is because we've uh, our, the test holes that we've uh, that we've excavated. We know where estimated seasonal high groundwater is, and not only is is the parking garage well above that elevation, our stormwater management structures that are under the ground have to be so many feet above that elevation. So we're very confident that the uh, that the parking garage is going to be well above elevation 84. And all you have to do is take a look at what the um, take a look at the con the uh, contours that are proposed, the floor elevations. Uh, the 100 year flood elevation is elevation 84 on the plan. Okay, we're great. Well above that. And as far as the 1.5 parking ratio, um, I know we'll probably talk about that more later, but is there some type of parking management plan proposed? Or is it going to be free for all as far as where residents can park and how many cars can be on the site? Will there be, re in other words, I think, will there be assigned spots or not? Reserved, assigned? 
So at this point, I think that's something that uh, that the uh, the owner hasn't decided. Okay. Uh, but we're willing to to hear some ideas. Okay. That's everything I have. To. Mm -hmm. All right. Well. <clears throat> As has been said, this is a kickoff meeting. I mean, we're all here to digest the information to be presented by the contractor, the developer, and I'm interested in hearing from the, the folks in the neighborhood. They did a heck of a job putting <laughs> their response together. Uh, and then there's been a couple of DRT meetings on the part of the town of Reading already. There's a lot of information that needs to be digested and put together and thought through. I think this place, this development, has the potential to be a really nice development and improve the property that's there now. The major considerations I have, and I'm not going to get into the detail of them at this point in time, some of them have already been identified. I think one major issue to me is the concept, the whole egress access to this development from both Eaton Street and Salem Street and Walker Brook Drive. Uh, it's obvious that Lakeview Avenue is a disaster. It's, it's terrible and it needs to be redone. And how far you how far you carry that in the opposite direction up along Eaton Street remains to be seen, but uh, that has to be thought through. And the main intersection that bothers me more than anything <coughs> else is the one at Walker Brook, uh, Walker Brook, and in, in General Way, and uh, and Lakeview. I mean, there's a lot of cars coming from all kinds of directions there. Okay, and and be interesting to see what the thought process yields for us in terms of that particular intersection. The other thing that I'm interested in and making sure of is that the conservation laws and the environmental laws of the state are met. Uh, that's an area which has a lot of wetlands and brooks and all that kind of stuff around it. I just want to make damn sure that that's all well addressed. Uh, the size of the, develop of the development comes across to me as big. We went through this with Reading Village down by the train station and they did ultimately reduce the size of that project by one story, okay? I felt at the time that maybe if you took it down to another story, it would have fit beautifully into that area. And, and if you look at this one, uh, I don't know what the economic number of units is for you folks, okay, that, that makes the project worthwhile. Maybe that's something we talk about later. But I think that if you took a three-story operation in this, in this area, would. Be, would, to my view, would be really, really nice and pristine. But there's probably issues to be dis discussed as to whether you can or cannot or should or should not do that. I think the DRT reviews that have been done so far and the community uh, uh, the neighbors and their response has been well done. Uh, and I frankly think at this point, uh, what I've read in the document, and it's been it's been amplified on a little bit in the presentation tonight, I think there's a lot of issues that have been raised in both places that still need to be addressed in some substance, and I have no qualms or concerns that they will be. So I look forward to this whole process. Hopefully you can come to a, a good finale here that's, that's pleasing and acceptable to all parties. That's all I have to say. Well... You will remember. A lot has been written by uh, the HCD in their October of uh, 17 um, letter. Um, one was uh, indicating what the community was looking for, and it mentioned four particular items. I won't go into them, but they've already been mentioned. And then it talked about uh, also. Um, the issues that DHCD felt needed to be addressed um, at these hearings. And those are somewhat the same, but a few of them are different. And because this is an initial meeting, we're not going to get into all of this, because as was mentioned by Chris before, um, we haven't heard from a lot of the, uh, the staff yet, police, fire, engineering, um, all, all of them need to address something. Some of this has been addressed at the uh, um, DRT. The, uh, the DRT meetings, but not all. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hold because of the time issue that, that, that we're under two. But I do want to bring up one issue that I should have brought up earlier, and I apologize for this. Um, you see sitting before you four members of the Board of Appeals this evening. It should be five members of the Board of Appeals. One is out. 
Uh, he phoned in, he's sick, he could not make it. So, um, this, to move forward, we need to have five members of the board uh, be sitting here. Um, there is a, an option, and that's called the Mullen Rule, in which um, Eric can look at the tape that's being made with uh, Reading um, RCTV. RCTV, uh, the Reading side, <laughs> you're there right now. And he can come back, sign off on that, and he can be he can be up to date. Not that we've accomplished an awful lot tonight, but he can see all of that stuff. The intention is that we only have uh, a seven-member board. We're down one because we don't have an alternate. We have two alternates and five regular members. The issue tonight is that one of our members, one alternate is not, we do not have it on the board, and the chair had recused himself from this, so we're already down to five. So we want to proceed with five. So some of that is going to be in, in scheduling. We want to make sure that all five members can be here because this Mullen Act takes time to get people acclimated to where we are as we move forward. And you can only do it once. That's right. <laughs> that's correct. And that's why we want to be very careful on the future meetings. We didn't expect this tonight, but we were under the gun again. Uh, because of the uh, the deadline requirements under 40B, and we had to we had to move forward. So we want to make sure in the future that we schedule the meetings appropriately. And who is the uh, member that uh, couldn't attend tonight? Eric Eric Hagstrom. H A H A G S T R O N. S -T -R -O -N. Okay. And, and the chair. Uh, has excused himself? He recused himself, yes. That's why, as vice chair, I'm taking over. Okay. Uh, the next item uh, that I have is the letter that was submitted by uh, your team, uh, Ted. And I'm going to ask uh, Robert or, or Sai if they'd be willing to read that into the record. Is this the one we uh, received tonight, February 26th? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, I'll be, I'll be glad to. Uh, uh, John Jurema, Acting Chair, Zoning Board of Appeals. This letter is, is from the, the applicant's attorney, I should say. Uh, signing Eaton Lakeview Development, LLC, uh, 2325 Lakeview Avenue, 128 East Street, Reading, Mass. Dear Mr. Jurema and members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, this office represents Eaton Lakeview Development, LLC, Eaton Lakeview which filed an application for, for a comprehensive permit with the Zoning Board of Appeals on January 9, 2018. Eaton Lakeview understands that the Department of Housing and Community Development has certified that the Town of Reading is in compliance with its housing production plan and that this certification is effective through February 22, 2019. Eaton Lakeview wishes to proceed with the referenced application, notwithstanding its understanding that this DHCD, that's being the uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, certification provides the ZBA with a basis to deny or conditionally approve the application pursuant to uh, 760 uh, Code of What's it in, in uh, Massachusetts regulations, right? Code of Massachusetts regulations, 56.3, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to read all those, I think. A right commonly referred to as safe harbor. I understand that there is a mutual desire to clarify how to apply the safe harbor under DHCD's regulations, and specifically, whether the regulations require the ZBA to deny the application within 15 days of the opening of the public hearing or simply to provide notice within those 15 days that a denial would be consistent with local needs. Eaton Lakeview hereby agrees that if the ZBA provides notice within 15 days of the opening of the public hearing that it believes that a denial of the permit or the 
imposition of the conditions or requirements would be consistent with local needs on the basis of the certification, then it need not actually deny the application on that basis within those same 15 days. In this event, the ZBA may proceed with the public hearing and its ability to deny the permit or impose conditions or requirements on the basis of the DHCD certification will be preserved. Stated differently, Eaton Lakeview waivers any claim that DHCD regulations require the ZBA to deny the application on the basis of the town safe harbor certification within 15 days after opening the public hearing. Further, Eaton Lakeview agrees that the time period for the town to exercise its safe harbor claim is hereby extended to February 22nd, 2019. In addition, 768 Code of Massachusetts Regulations states that the public hearing on a comprehensive permit application shall not extend beyond 180 days from the date of opening of the hearing except with the written consent of the applicant. Eaton Lakeview agrees to allow additional time for the ZBA to conduct its public hearing. Accordingly, Eaton Lakeview hereby agrees to extend the time for the ZBA to close the public hearing, vote, issue a decision, and file its decision with the town clerk on the subject comprehensive permit application to February 23, 2019. Sincerely, Theodore Reganetti, uh, to, and that was to the chair, okay. to the zoning board members. Thank you. Yes. I'm going to ask, um, I understand the conditions outside are getting worse. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Chris one more time to speak in plain English <laughs> so that everybody understands what safe harbor is, and then I'm going to ask one more thing of uh, uh, Gene to tell us a little bit about Safe Harbor and the uniqueness of this in the state as well as in the region. Chris? Uh, sure. So under um, the state regulations, the board has the ability when a Safe Harbor is in effect in town to either deny a comprehensive permit application or to uh, impose conditions that it might not, not otherwise be able to impose on the grounds that they might render the project uneconomic or violate 40B in some other way. So you have the power, the board has the power, as long as the safe harbor is in place, to deny the application or to impose conditions that might otherwise be problematic. Um, you, the, there is presently right now a safe harbor in effect in the town of Reading and that is, on the, that is because the town has uh, recently produced enough dwelling units in town, affordable dwelling units, to meet um, the requirements of its housing production plan. So the town has, through the course of permitting other projects, uh, produced enough affordable units to satisfy DHCD that the town is doing what it is supposed to do <coughs> under its housing production plan. D DHCD has certified that in writing, and that written certification uh, gives the town that safe harbor. Now, how do we use the safe harbor? In order to use the safe harbor, the Zoning Board of Appeals, starting tonight, must, within 15 days, uh, vote to uh, provide the applicant with written notice and with a copy to DHCD that it believes that it, the safe harbor is in effect, and as a result, that the board has the right to issue a denial or a conditional approval um, that would be consistent with local needs. Um, so, and it can vote to provide that notice to the applicant. The applicant has made clear um, that it, the board does not actually need to deny the application. It can just provide notice that it believes the safe harbor is in effect um, and then can later on turn to use it on, as a basis for denial or conditional approval if it wants to. But the, I think the, the important step if the board wants to exercise the safe harbor. Or exercise is probably the wrong word. Believes it can use the safe harbor, and I believe that to be true, then it needs to, tonight, vote to provide that written notice to the applicant. 
<coughs> and the, on top of that, the applicant has extended the time from the 180 days to the deadline, which is the 22nd of February of 2019, to come up with a solution uh, for this development, uh, the 40B, which uh, then puts them back on the board again to put with the potential of getting another safe harbor for another period of time if we can come to that agreement. And that that is an important point that I think I neglected to mention, which is that the, this, this date that we've put everything off to off in the future, of February 22nd, 2019, is the date that the safe harbor would go automatically go away because it is limited in time. When you are certified by DHCD, when the town is certified to be in compliance with its housing production plan, that is a, uh, a year or two year long safe harbor period that goes into effect. The one that is currently in place is two years long, and it will go away on February 22nd, 2019. So that's, that's the reason that date was, was selected. Okay. Now I'm going to ask Jean, and then I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask, come back to you and ask you if you prepared a motion for us for this evening, which I would like to take a vote on. Okay, so Jean, yes, um, tell us a little bit about this. I, I will. I just, I want to preface my comments by saying that I don't want to alarm anyone, but two other boards uh, recessed a short time ago, and I'm getting text messages on the treacherous driving conditions out there. So I just want everyone to be aware. Um, we had scheduled this meeting in March, and with the help of the applicant, we're given extended time so that we could avoid winter conditions. So, so much for planning. Um, but on a much more positive note, um, the work that we do, Julie, myself, Andrew, Kristen, um, we are planners and we come to work and proactively plan for things like affordable housing. And we have been diligently working to do what's right for the town of Reading, but also satisfy the mandate by the state that says if you don't have 10% of all the housing units in the community deed restricted as affordable and what they consider affordable housing, then you're subject to comprehensive permits that don't have to go by zoning. And um, because of, I, I want to say, the staff and credit the people that work for me as really working hard to not only do the planning work, but to also follow up in the myriad of regulations. And it is, it's a beast to get through the regulatory requirements. And because we've done the, the uh, housing production plan and produced the units, so we've planned and we've gotten results and actually produced units. The state has said, you are one of a handful of communities that are now meeting what you said you were going to do in your housing production plan and qualify to be a certified community. And in our case, it's for a two-year period. Unfortunately, one year's already gone. But it's, it's still a two-year period of certification. It's very rare. And I'm very proud of all the work that everyone's done. Um, and because we've done that work, we have this ability to now um, have more time, collaborate with the developer, and figure out the best way to make this project work for Reading. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Chris, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, I think we've asked you to draft a, a quick motion that would meet all the requirements um, to send a letter back to the applicant and to a D DCHD um, relative to a vote that was taken by us this evening. And I would prefer, rather than waiting the 15 days, uh, open it tonight, decide what we're going to do with it, and then move on. Good. And I, I have prepared such a motion on the assumption that you would want to invoke the safe harbor um, to, in, in terms of advising the applicant that you believe you can use it, uh, not actually denying the application tonight. Um, so I have a motion that would 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 have the board take that vote and instruct uh, town m town council to uh, prepare the written notice and send it to the applicant. Bob, would you want to read that motion? I would be glad to. Uh, it is hereby moved that the Zoning Board of Appeals vote to notify the applicant that it considers that a denial of the comprehensive permit 
of the imposition of conditions or requirements on the comprehensive permit will, would be consistent with local needs on the grounds that DHCD has certified the town's compliance with the goals of its approved housing production plan and to request that town council prepare a written notice to the applicant and to DHCD in accordance with 760 Code of Massachusetts Regulations 56.038A. We have a second for that motion. Second. So I second. Any discussion on the motion? We understand that we're we're going to uh, empower the safe harbor but we also are going to move on with your letter of understanding that you have uh, worked out with town council and, and the planning department and move forward so that we can get to the point where we need to get to well prior hopefully before the 23rd or the 22nd actually 23rd of uh next february, february 2019. And, and that is consistent with the letter that i submitted so. exactly which we read into the record any other discussion? Hearing no discussion. All, all members in favor, please indicate by raising your right hand and saying aye. 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 What the uh, vote shows clearly is the right hand. Now, I know that everybody is here this evening because we want to hear the rebuttal from the uh, neighborhood. I'm going to uh, move, um, accept the motion to continue the, the subject matter of this public hearing before we open up the public hearing, only because of the weather conditions. Um, I know one member of this table has got to travel to New Hampshire this evening, and as bad as it is here, I know it's far worse up there. Um, so uh, do I hear a motion? I know it's not for a popular one, but do I hear a motion? Uh, John, before we make a motion, what do we have in mind for the next meeting for this 40B? Would we it be had two set, weeks? We had set aside the 21st clearance-wise so that there is nothing else pending on the 21st. So that would be our date certain that we would okay. have to postpone. And if that's the case, if it is extended or continued to the 21st, can we start with the residents? Absolutely. On the 21st, then? 21st of March? March. Of March? Yes. Pardon? That's two weeks from today. 21st of March. Correct. Uh, yeah. 21st of March. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, I will um, make a motion then to uh, continue this meeting on Eaton Street, Lakeview 40B, until March 21st, uh, 2018. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Uh, where? Ah. Uh, <laughs> 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 it would be nice, but I think we'll leave that up to daytime government, what they decide, and then it would be posted. We'll do that. Check, people can check the website. Check the website. Okay. And no, I, I believe, Mr. Chairman, you need to designate where the meeting will be. I, I don't think you can leave it up in the air. Yeah. Well, we're I scheduled to be in this room. Okay. We'll schedule it right for this room then. Yeah. yeah. Then we'll yeah. continue the uh, subject matter of this hearing until the 21st in this room at some point. Mike Flynn, 190 Green Street. Uh, are there other rooms available? We obviously had a lot of members of the community um, that are interested in attending. They, they can't fit. Uh, we know we've taken taken these meetings to other locations in the past. Um, I would encourage that you know, while there's a, a group of people that are trying to represent the neighborhood concern. We certainly can't represent everything that they, everybody that wants to say something. And, and we would encourage you to, to find a place that can fit in. I don't know. Yeah, we don't yeah. know. So we could continue it to this room, and then can we, after that, like could do modify that. the yes. location to yeah. yeah. find that. a better yes. place? Okay. Okay. Okay, there's a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? Second. Do we have a uh, vote? All in favor? All those in favor? Aye. Uh, 4 zero, zero, okay. the 21st. Just real, unless you hear otherwise. In the way. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. Can I make one suggestion, please? No. 
Come down to see the scene, the scene of the crime. Come down after this rain, and you'll know why the building couldn't be there. I'm serious. Come right after this. I've been living here for 46 years in my house. You can't take any more. I'm just letting you know. Yeah. Come down to see it. All <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure.